I never thought the season would ever come that locals would come down to the boardwalk in the middle of summer and mingle with tourists from San Jose. The animosity between these two groups is as old as the sand itself, and yet somehow the seaside company is managing to attract more people than ever. I suspect that perhaps the boardwalk in the city of Santa Cruz itself is finally coming to terms with the spirit of a man who is the greatest promotional wizard Santa Cruz has ever known. This man is Fred Swanton, the man who gave the boardwalk the shape it has more than 80 years ago, helped develop it, and a man who loved bright lights, speculation, big schemes, and a lot of hot air. Hot air balloons were just one of Fred Swanton's many schemes as he shaped the boardwalk from 1903 to 1913. Raised in Santa Cruz, Swanton was known to back anything with glitter and flash, from inventions such as electric lights and telephones to entertainments such as Venetian water carnivals and beauty pageants. His financial ventures ranged from movie stars and streetcars to oil wells. Following the lead of the Sea Beach, the only luxury hotel, Swanton had a vision of Santa Cruz as a high-class but affordable resort town. One of his early promotions was an electric railway line from Santa Cruz to Watsonville, a service completed as far as Capitola in 1904. He also helped to bring the Ocean Shore Railroad to Santa Cruz, bringing tourists from San Francisco. Boasting as many as 500 dressing rooms, a cafe, grill, ballroom, and roof gardens, the Neptune Casino was one of Swanton's finest achievements before 1905. The season of 1906 was to be the most elaborate, the most successful. It was, instead, the most disastrous. On the first official day of summer, June 22nd, the casino plunge and most of Tent City was consumed by fire. Far from discouraged, Swanton promised the buildings would be replaced before the start of the next season, and the framework for the second casino was already up by New Year's Day. And so it was, 80 years ago, that the boardwalk took on the shape and features that it has today. It was truly an impressive achievement, one that Swanton celebrated with the motto, Santa Cruz, never a dull moment. Every once in a while, driving from Live Oak to Aptos, without thinking, I drive down through Capitola and find myself stuck in a massive traffic jam. With nothing better to do for the next half hour, I look down in the village and think how nice it might have been to visit here maybe 75 or 100 years ago. Back in those days, Capitola was a summer resort that closed down completely in the wintertime. Nobody ever had to look for a place to park because nobody owned a car. Everyone came by train. They came with trunks, bringing their families and sometimes their neighbors, planning to stay for a month or more. Children and parents ran around in layered swimsuits with hats and booties, eating ice cream and waffles, fishing and having a good time. In later years, they could stay in quaint little cottages. It must have been a nice place. But when you think about it, was it really such a good time? Capitola likes to boast that it's the oldest continuous resort on the California coast. This doesn't mean, however, that it was any more successful or charming than the others now gone. Capitola was a humble camp with a budget reputation for many years before it assumed the airs of a resort by the sea. Built on swampland, it began as a haven for middle-income people desperate to escape the heat, and what it offered beyond fog was nothing fancy. Summer tourists of the 1870s slept in tents with dirt or board floors next to agricultural fields where kids could get a nickel apiece for gopher tails if they were in a mood to go hunting. There weren't any cars but lots of horses, so the avenues between the tents were caked with animal wastes and other gooey things. The main thoroughfare was dotted with outhouses for years. Garbage collected in the vicinity of today's city hall, so the smell of the whole campground was less than delightful. Consider also that Capitola is downstream from the town of Soquel, which was a bustling industrial center in the 1870s. South Coast Paper Mill, located just above Soquel, was one of the factories that dumped refuse directly into the creek. A flume was only a temporary solution since it washed downstream in practically every storm. Think of it, no modern sewer system. Everything washed out to sea and just as easily washed back in again. Into this environment came romping beachgoers, men, women, and children in those frightfully amusing costumes, complete with their little caps and booties, and now we know why. Often made of worsted wool, these get-ups could be real scratchy sand catchers and very revealing when wet. Bathers were seldom carefree in the water. Unless they were strong swimmers, they obeyed the bell and held onto a rope as they waded to and from the shore. 
Others frolicked about, bobbed up and down the shore, sharing the beach with fish and fowl. Some of the fish were the big ones old-timers like to brag about. There were fish of all descriptions, including sharks. The waters were not as safe as one might assume. When evening came, so did the bugs. Flies, fleas, and mosquitoes accompanied tourists everywhere. Those seeking a good time on the shoreline usually had to stroll on Lover's Lane or went roller skating in the big hall. But since hardly anyone had enough clothes for the entire summer, and there were no laundromats, it was hard for singles to appear fashionably smart or romantically appealing. Capitola Village is built in a bowl shape, a natural amphitheater, and late night noise has always been a problem. Everybody could hear everybody else's good time. And what about food? Without electric refrigeration, perishables kept in a tent were quick to spoil. The nearest shopping was at Angel's store in Soquel, a walk of more than a mile and a half. Resort treats were plentiful and tasty, but could also be dangerous. Most candy was covered, for instance, with toxic paint. Finally, there is the nostalgia of the train. How fun it must have been to roll into the depot after a ride from the city. But who said the ride was comfortable? The coaches could be suffocating. There was no check system for baggage, train schedules were unreliable, and accidents, even in Capitola, were known to happen. Tourists came from hot regions, suffered extreme discomfort to get here, and then walked about in clothes we'd now consider a bit much, even for the dead of winter. No wonder they were content to sit for hours. Most of them were both in a fog and a state of mild shock. Uh, so, um, self-accomplishment. Um, a feeling that, yes, I could run part of the 35 miles and togetherness with everybody else and becoming known. It's squeaky, that's why. A lot of people swear that Live Oak has no history. Usually these people are from Santa Cruz, which over the years has found Live Oak a conven convenient spot to dump practically everything it doesn't want. Everything from mobile home parks and senior citizens to single families and multiple family dwellings. Live Oak is a place where people live and it does have a history. One example, and a surprising one, is the California Egg Lang Contest. You could say it was chickens that laid the foundations for live oak development. Long, narrow poultry sheds so marked the land it was known as Chicken Alley by 1910. Chanticleer Avenue became a tribute to the call of the rooster. Santa Cruz Hatchery, continuing today as Cal Cruz, specialized in the sale of white leghorns. Within a decade, the whole area, up to the foothills of De La Viega Park, clucked along as Chicken Town. Ranches boasting more than a thousand chickens helped Live Oak peck its way to the top of county production tables. Then in the 1920s, the California Egg Lane Contest settled at Pacheco and Morrissey Boulevard near the Santa Cruz city limit. Competition featured hens from as far as New York, although winners were often local. In 1923, for example, 10 Live Oak Leghorns laid a record-breaking 2,800 eggs in one year. So Live Oak found a unique listing in county tourist brochures, but eggs were not the whole of it. Live Oak also gained recognition for exotic bulbs and flowers. Anyone who watched an early Capitola Begonia Festival has appreciated Live Oak industry. Freesias once grew near 7th Avenue, and Lilydale graced the acres at 17th and Eastcliff Drive. Perhaps the best known of the bulb ranchers was James Brown, who purchased a tract along 41st Avenue in 1911. After a try at strawberries, the Browns turned to flowers and became top producers of begonias. The Browns also took pride in a family dairy, supplying local communities with fresh milk and moo cow ice cream. Brown cows had calves pretty enough to pose with the first Miss California, Fay Lamb Fair. Brown family land is still familiar and important to county residents, recognized today as the site of Capitola Mall. Live Oak once was so wide open and flat that barnstorming aviators found it perfect for impromptu landings. Brown's Ranch was a popular runway. Kids at Live Oak School often got to inspect the latest style and aircraft. But Live Oak landings weren't always smooth. One 1923 mishap drew a sizable crowd to the neighborhood of Woods Lagoon, an area we know now as the Yacht Harbor. Woods Lagoon, named for John Woods, and Schwann Lagoon, owned by Jacob Swan, were the twin lakes that once embraced a prominent Live Oak resort. The California Baptist Association picked it as a campsite in 1890. The church spire was surrounded by modest cabins that had a stop on both the street rail line and the electric railway that later ran from Santa Cruz to Capitola. Santa Maria del Mar, established in 1891, was the resort of the Catholic Ladies' Aid Society. While its original hotel is long gone, the conference center continues today as Via Maria del Mar. 
So where is downtown Live Oak and what is its history? From chickens and slaughterhouses to bulbs and tourists, from senior citizens and shopping malls to laundromats and surf shops, a little bit of Santa Cruz County is everywhere in Live Oak. Poor and rich, beautiful and ugly, hard and soggy, Live Oak is where the ordinary can sometimes be pretty amazing. down. <laughs> 19th century photographers have taught me over and over that history is more than state old houses and parched documents. Capitola in particular is one community that owes the artist of the camera a great debt. It's actually our grandmothers and grandfathers, great aunts and uncles, and even total strangers who've come here, stood on this very spot, looked at this great view, and taken a photograph. Ten years later, someone else comes along, takes the same picture. What's in between is history. Although she had no camera, Martina Castro had by far the best view. Martina was the first in a series of rather unusual personalities that shaped Capitola history and gave this community the tenacity it needed to survive. Never considered a beauty, Martina nonetheless acquired three husbands, nine children, and more than 34,000 acres between the beach and the top of Loma Prieta. Martina's story is a sad one. Nearly all her land fell into the hands of Yankee settlers in the early years of California statehood. The shrewd entrepreneur, Frederick Heen, bought SoCal Landing and designed a tiny European-style resort. He named it Camp Capitola in recognition of SoCal's attempt to woo the state legislature in 1869. SoCal was ready but the legislature was not. Frederick Keene is probably the most important figure in Santa Cruz County history. In addition to varied enterprises, he owned all of Capitola, Aptos, Valencia, Felton, and the bulk of downtown Santa Cruz. He was bright, cunning, and protective of all his holdings, so he treated Capitola very well. In 1874, he brought the railroad line to ensure a continuing supply of tourists. The big trestle looked very impressive on picture postcards. Pretty soon, there was a depot, then another, and another. The trestle filled in, tents became cabins, the beach got a boardwalk and a wagon bridge. The wharf extended many feet out to sea. Near the turn of the century, Heen's first hotel was replaced with a massive structure that featured 160 rooms, a bathhouse, billiard room, bowling alley, and bar. The village had pleasure boats and a dance hall, a skating rink, and shooting gallery. An Italian fishing village nestled near the wharf. Capitola had lots of charm. In 1904, a trolley from Santa Cruz added another bridge. This line continued a little more than 20 years until hard times and motor traffic signaled the end of the Heen era and years of hard adjustments to modern life. Heen died in 1913. His daughter sold the entire resort in 1919 to Capitola's mysterious landlord, Henry Allen Rispin, a reputed oil millionaire. From his hillside mansion, Rispin promoted the resort in a new image as Capitola by the Sea. He had visions of country clubs, golf courses, cottage bungalows, and a new era of tourism. But Rispin was also a recluse, an alcoholic during Prohibition, and all he really accomplished for Capitola was the paving of its streets. During the 20s, the Italian fishing village disappeared and work started on the Venetian courts, the coast's first experiment with condominium-style housing. In 1925, an Australian named Evie Woodhouse bought Heem's Hotel and invested his inheritance on new attractions for the Esplanade. Unfortunately, Capitola had forgotten about the force of nature. The storm and tide of February 1926 was a brutal reminder. The bathhouse was replaced and continued untouched for many decades until another reminder was delivered in February of 1983. Some people never learn. In 1929, Rispin went broke and the whole resort was auctioned to the highest bidder. Late in December, the Capitola Hotel burned in a mysterious fire. This event was the first in a string of fires to plague the village in the 1930s. In 1933, for example, both the Hawaiian Gardens nightclub and a yacht club on the wharf were consumed by flames. Somehow, Capitola endured, gradually taking the shape we recognize today. Frederick King would be proud. Capitola is comfortable, never pretentious, confident, successful, and a little bit crazy. Just the way he planned it, and just the way we like it. Okay. I know it seems peculiar. That's all right. <laughs> Everything looks peculiar. Can a visitor to Santa Cruz for the first time walk down Front Street and Pacific Avenue 
and get a good idea of what this community is really like. I think you can. Walking down the mall, you'll see historical buildings, interesting storefronts, and a wide variety of people doing things sometimes typical and sometimes quite bizarre. If this is true now, what might we learn about downtown Santa Cruz by walking down this street through time? A walk downtown ought to begin from a logical spot, and from a historical view, this one's pretty significant. The first commercial building in downtown Santa Cruz was built by Elahu Anthony in 1848. It stood on one of the few parcels open to Yankee settlement in the early days of California statehood. The first Anthony building was replaced by another in 1875, which eventually became the site of the Mission Garage. Frederick Keene, the man who had the greatest influence on development in Santa Cruz County, began his married life in 1853 by taking residence on the upper floor of a little store at the junction of Pacific and Front Street. And what did he see from his window? Not much, according to later historians who said the early buildings of downtown Santa Cruz were a cheap style of architecture. The streets of the two principal towns were in a wretched condition. Sidewalks were not much in vogue, he said. In the rainy season, the traveler took desperate chances, especially at nighttime. Continuing a few years in time, and downtown still has its hazards. There were fires, for instance, like the one that burned the Swanton Family Hotel in the May of 1887. A few years later, the county courthouse, the pride and joy of the business district, suffered a similar fate. The fire of 1894 took out most of the buildings at Front and Cooper, including the firehouse. Land for a new courthouse was donated by the Cooper brothers, and we know it today as the Cooper House. Floods were another problem. One in 1940 made a mess of Cooper Street at the edge of Chinatown. But the best remembered and most destructive was the flood of 1955. This one reached the basement of the courthouse, destroying many old records. The residents of Chinatown were forced to relocate, and an era of Santa Cruz history was ended. In happier times, Pacific Avenue has seen many a good parade. Admission Day was a particular favorite before 1900. Carnivals came and went, as did political welcomes for Presidents McKinley, Harrison, and Roosevelt. World War I brought a different kind of parade. Celebrating the end of the war was a big moment in city history. How about a cruise down the block? Traffic, by the way, went in two directions, whether by horse, buggy, bicycle, streetcar, or automobile. Pacific Avenue remains a popular thoroughfare, a place where exciting things happen. A shopping trip through time will yield all kinds of treasure. From produce markets to early day leasks and a curio store, Santa Cruz has a variety of stuff. You could buy watches from Mr. Trumbly or meat from the independent market. Billboards were legal, gas was cheap, and entertainment light. This tour stops at the St. George Hotel, which once enjoyed some stature in town. Visitors there would be shocked to know the days to come of the hip pocket bookstore and the catalyst and the hippies of the 1960s that took rooms next to the elderly borders. But that's another story, before Pacific Avenue knew the meaning of the words one way, garden, and mall. Okay. This is the Palo Alto. Most people know it as the cement ship. It kind of looks like a boat, but what it actually is is the California amusement industry's longest decaying and most conspicuous mishap. Speculators dreaming of subdivisions on California's coastline saw the Aptos Beach as a potential paradise by the sea in the 1920s. It was a decade that brought nearly two million immigrants to the state in search of jobs and housing. Increasing automobile traffic, available mortgages, and tracks of untampered coastline inspired cliffside development in Santa Cruz County. In 1922, Santa Cruz Land and Title Company sketched the first maps for the entrance to what is now Seacliff Beach State Park. No less than six more maps were filed before work began the next year. Meanwhile, a boat made of Santa Cruz cement sat idle in San Francisco Bay, awaiting a peculiar fate. The ship was the Palo Alto, built of cement for service as an oil tanker, but denied even a maiden voyage at the end of the First World War. It was launched sideways at the government shipyards in Oakland on May 29, 1919, and stayed there 10 years before it finally caught the eye of an Aptos developer. The Cal Neva Company bought the ship in 1929, which was not a great year for this kind of venture. 
It took 15 hours to tow the ship by tug, and a crowd of several hundred had gathered to watch the arrival on January 23, 1930. It was secured in place on a sea rock bed. Originally, the Palo Alto was to be an offshore gambling and amusement center. Legally, this plan proved touchy, however, and it was transformed instead to a pleasure ship for dancing, dining, and swimming. More than 80 workers toiled throughout the winter and spring to outfit the ship and build a 630-foot pier. A crowd of more than 3,000 people came aboard for the grand event. Designed as the most unique amusement enterprise in the Monterey Bay region, the heyday of the Palo Alto was extremely brief. A bad storm in the winter of 1931-32 broke the vessel and ended its career in entertainment. The depression ended the ambitions of its backers. The ship sat wounded, unattended, for another half decade before it was bought by the state. It eventually reopened as a haven for fishermen and seagulls, enjoying its reputation as a monument to the wild, lavish, and bankrupt dreams of 1929. Um, I'm going to run the whole thing, and they're going to run with me as partners. So They've already told me they'd do that. So That's one year for every year of my life here. So. Are you encouraged? Are you going to come back on the 17th of January? We run 47 miles. <laughs> we'll be here. All right. <laughs> Are you encouraged? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. I'm really encouraged by our students. Um, this has been a great year. We've only been in session a week. And um, sometimes I feel like uh, they're taking off, and I, I'm, I'm trying to run and keep up with them. They're really excited this year and, and an exciting class to be with. Now, what is the significance of this run? This is actually an old Indian tradition. Mm -hmm. that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And well, as we explained to the students, runners went from tribe to other tribes or from nation to other nation and learned from the elders of that other tribe and then brought that information back. And so they had to be trustworthy and they had to be honorable and they had to be clean of mind and clean of spirit because they needed to remember all of these things. And they would travel great distances, they run great distances. You know. And so we try to impress upon them the fact that this is really an honor to be a runner and the first runners of the day.